Okay, welcome comrades uh, for the uh, afternoon session today, World Revolution and uh, Socialism in One Country. So after the defeat of uh, revolutions in uh, more advanced capitalist countries and uh, Lenin's death, the bureaucracy in Russia was able to rise and uh, Stalin's uh, reactionary and nationalist theory of so socialism in one country uh, has been developed. And this theory is the exact opposite of the ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky who always had an uh, international, internationalist uh, perspective on revolution. So our uh, speaker will be Josh Holroyd. He's a leading comrade of the Revolutionary uh, Communist International. And he is also the editor of our theoretical magazine, the In Defense of, In Defense of Marxism magazine. And he will speak for around one and a half uh, hours, including translations. So if you just started uh, watching from home, uh, you will notice there will be some pauses uh, during uh, the speak. And this is because uh, we are translating our sessions into several languages. So I'm not going to uh, take up more of your time and uh, will ask Josh to uh, start the session. <laughs> Thank you. Workers of the world unite. So concludes the Communist Manifesto, the founding document of our movement. These words of Marx and Engels were nothing other than a rallying cry for world revolution, for which they tried to arm communists in 1848. This principle was also central to the ideas of Lenin and the Bolshevik Party. But roughly 100 years ago, in the autumn of 1924, Stalin presented his theory of socialism in one country. This represented a departure from Marxism in favour of national prejudice and reformism, and it lay the theoretical basis for some of the worst catastrophes ever endured by the world working class. Today, the USSR, from which this theory emanated, no longer exists, and many of the communist parties that inscribed it on their banner have disappeared from history. But this theory continues to be raised in the communist movement today, and it is an important issue for us to discuss. Because in the revolutionary epoch which we have entered, we must have the clearest ideas in order for the World Socialist Revolution to be victorious. I want to start with the question, what is internationalism? Again, from the Communist Manifesto, the workers have no country. What did Marx and Engels mean by this? It wasn't simply a vague moral principle, and it certainly didn't mean the brotherhood of nations that middle-class pacifists tended to put, talk about. In fact, the Communist Manifesto speaks explicitly about national differences and nation states disappearing altogether. For them, communism and socialism was international or it was nothing. And this reflected the international and interconnected nature of the capitalist system itself. And therefore the international nature of the class struggle. As I'm sure we can all see, capitalism is a global system. Every country is inextricably linked to and dominated by the world market. And through the world market, production itself has become global. Factories in one part of the world produce commodities with more raw materials from another part, using machinery imparted, imported sorry, from another part. Even in 1848, Marx and Engels noted, in place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations. Since then, what Marx and Engels identified has been developed to the highest degree under imperialism. Single companies like Amazon or big car companies like Nissan span the entire globe, exploiting workers and resources on every continent. And entire industries can be transported from one part of the world to the other just to exploit cheap labor and make higher profits. And this means that the struggle of the workers in one country is necessarily linked to the struggle of workers in other countries. For instance, we've often seen in the advanced capitalist countries, when workers fight for better wages and conditions, their employers will sometimes threaten that they'll just move their workplace, their factory, to a totally different country. Only solidarity and common struggle between the workers can defeat the capitalist class. And that applies to both the advanced imperialist countries and the countries that are dominated by imperialism. Engels pointed out a long time ago that a working class that supports the domination of another nation forges its own chains. And from this fact stems the need for internationalism not just as a nice idea, but as an objective necessity for the working class. And I found a quote from Lenin which I think sums up his attitude to this question. He writes, I must argue 
not from the point of view of my country, for that is the argument of a wretched, stupid, petty bourgeois nationalist who does not realize that he is only a plaything in the hands of the imperialist bourgeoisie, but from the point of view of my share in the, propaga uh, the preparation, in the propaganda, and in the acceleration of the world proletarian revolution. He adds, that is what internationalism means. And that is the duty of the internationalist, the revolutionary worker, the genuine socialist. But what does the international struggle of the working class mean in, uh, you know, the international revolutionary struggle of the working class mean in practice? Do we mean we prepare for the, the workers of every single country to take power at once? I think we have to rule that out as, if not completely impossible, at least very, very unlikely. So how can the Royal Revolution take place? Now, one of the central contradictions of the entire capitalist system is between the productive forces unleashed by capitalism, and these are international, global in character, as I briefly described, and the conflict between these and the narrow limits of the capitalist nation state, which continues to exist. Each capitalist class has its own state and its own national market, which it jealously defends against its rivals. And this places an objective limit to the further development, the unleashing of the potential of the productive forces that even exist today. But these nation states still exist. And the presence of these nation states, each with their own class struggles in their own conditions of development, level, different levels of development, means that the workers will almost certainly not conquer power in all countries at once, but first in a single country. And Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, having said the workers have no country, say the following. The struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. Because of course the workers, this is not Marx and Engels, this is me now, because the workers are of course living and fighting within, uh, you know, against and within the confines of the bourgeois nation state. Marx and Engels continue, the proletariat of each country must of course, first of all, settle matters with its own bourgeoisie. And Marx called the class rule, the settling of accounts if you like, and the setting up of the class rule of the working class, the dictatorship of the proletariat. And he said this was the revolutionary political transition between capitalism and what he called the first phase of communist society, which is often called socialism. But having defeated and expropriated their own bourgeoisie, what does this revolutionary transitional state do? Marx answers the following, and I, I apologize for, this is quite a long quote, but I make no apologies for quoting Marx. This is from 1850. While the democratic petty bourgeois wish to bring the revolution to a conclusion as quickly as possible, it is our interest and our task to make the revolution permanent until all more or less possessing classes have been forced out of their position of dominance, until the proletariat has conquered state power, and the association of proletarians, not only in one country, but in all the dominant countries of the world, has advanced so far that competition among the proletarians of these countries has ceased, and that at least the decisive productive forces are concentrated in the hands of the proletarians, the workers. The reason for this is not only to break the inevitable blockade and military intervention of the capital, hostile capitalist powers, but even more important, that the building of even the first stage of communism, so socialism, requires the most advanced productive forces developed under capitalism in order to harmoniously plan production to meet the needs of all of society. And what I've just quoted from Marx was exactly the program of Lenin and the Bolshevik party. As it happened, in 1917, the socialist revolution broke out not just in one country, but in the most back economically backward country in Europe. The capitalist system broke at its weakest link. So could socialism be built in Russia, which was a semi-feudal country even before the war, but now had been devastated by the First World War as well? Lenin made himself clear on this on many occasions, that this was impossible. Lenin explained the goal of the Russian Revolution was not to set up a single isolated socialist state in Russia, but as the first step in the world socialist revolution. To give one example, he says, we are far from having completed even the transitional period from capitalism to socialism. And he adds, we have never cherished the hope that we could finish it without the aid of the international proletariat. And on another occasion in 1921, he said, it is the absolute truth that without a German revolution, we are doomed. And it was in this spirit that the Communist International was founded in 1919. Again, not just as a, a meeting for communists around the world, but as an instrument of world socialist revolution, a world party of socialist revolution, if you like. And the Leninist position that I just described was repeated by Stalin in, in, at the beginning of 1924. After Lenin's death, Stalin gave a series of lectures called the Foundations of Leninism 
which was published as a pamphlet. And in this pamphlet, we find, can the final victory of socialism in one country be attained without the joint efforts of the proletariat of several advanced countries? No, this is impossible. But within a few months, that pamphlet was withdrawn from circulation by Stalin himself. So to be fair, he didn't just censor everyone else, he also censored himself. In the autumn of the same year, a new version of the pamphlet was released, which in the same section says the following. After consolidating its power and leading the peasantry in its wake, the proletariat of the victorious country can and must build a socialist society. This might seem like only a small change on the face of it, but it marks a fundamental shift from the revolutionary internationalism of Marx, Engels, Lenin. And it's not an accident that Stalin presented this idea after Lenin's death, because Lenin would never have tolerated it in the ranks of the Bolshevik party. The priority of the leadership of the Soviet Union had been shifted towards building socialism by themselves rather than spreading the world revolution. And this just wasn't sort of a random mistake on Stalin's point. This idea apart, it didn't come from nowhere, this idea. The different ideas that gain prominence in society reflect material and particularly class pressures. The Russian Revolution of 1917 was followed by a wave of revolutions in a number of European countries. In Austria, in Germany, in Hungary, Bulgaria, and a, a revol mass revolu revolutionary movement in Italy, and many other European countries were on the verge of revolution. But in all of these countries, the ruling class and the, the social democratic parties had su succeeded in either crushing the revolutionary movement or diverting it into safer channels. And the failure of the German Communist Party to launch a successful insurrection in the autumn of 1923 brought this period of revolutionary advance to an end. Capitalism has succeeded in stabilizing itself temporarily and hence the world revolution was delayed. Crucially, the USSR remained isolated. However, the imperialist powers weren't able to destroy, crush the USSR at this time because their own internal crises and powerful movements of the working class prevented them from doing so. And this created a temporary and inherently unstable equilibrium in the middle of the 20s. At the same time, within the Soviet Union, the state had shifted from direct requisitions of grain from the, from the peasantry and war communism to making concessions to the market and, uh, and encouraging peasants to produce a surplus to sell. Lenin explained that this was a retreat, but a necessary one in order to preserve the worker state until the world revolution rises up again. But the economic recovery that was taking place was um, developing a larger layer of middle class and bureaucrats within the state. It was strengthening wealthier layers of the peasantry who obviously had more surplus to sell. But the workers who were the ruling class in the dictatorship of the proletariat had been exhausted by war, revolution, civil war, famine, and were elbowed out of the way by these better off middle class petty bourgeois layers in the Soviets themselves. And the pressure of these petty bourgeois layers was reflected in the Communist Party, in the leadership. And it expressed itself in the worship of gradual, peaceful development towards socialism. This was epitomized by the phrase of Nikolai Bukharin, socialism at a tortoise pace. Rather than world revolution, exporting the revolution, which necessarily entails further conflict and disruption, both internally and externally, both the domestic and foreign policy of the Soviet Union adapted itself and empirically started to follow the path of least resistance. Hold off imperialist intervention through diplomacy and vague pressure from the workers in those countries, not the seizure of power, and promote and encourage the, uh, the, the ac accumulation of private wealth by the uh, peasantry. All of a sudden, this retreat was, ex uh, was presented as a step towards socialism. And part of the reason for that is that the Stalin faction of, the, Sov of the, the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was also under pressure from the left opposition led by Leon Trotsky, who continued to defend the Leninist line. And so to protect themselves, this developing bureaucracy in the Soviet Union presented their own interests as the interests of building socialism for all in the Soviet Union. And at the same time, the ideas of Lenin were denounced as Trotskyism. All of a sudden, it was announced that the USSR had the material prerequisites for the building of socialism at a time when its economy was extremely backward compared to the West. And in addition to gradualness, this petty bourgeois pressure on the, the party reflected itself also in, a, in, in increasing nationalist sentiment. The idea, we, we don't need foreigners to help us. We Russians can build socialism ourselves. We're special. 
And perhaps surprisingly, you might think, this national, this messianic nationalist prejudice found its counterpart in the infamous theory of two stages everywhere else in the world. In 1925, a huge revolution erupted in China. One of the main demands of this movement was national unification and eviction of foreign imperialism. And the, the uh, working class of China was tiny compared to the peasantry, but you could have said the same thing about the Russian working class in 1917, which began not as an explicit socialist revolution, but as a democratic revolution against Tsarism and against the war. But according to the Soviet bureaucracy, China was not ready for the socialist revolution. It had first to carry out its national democratic revolution, such as reunification. And the workers would have to ally themselves with the peasantry. And it's true that if the peasantry is the majority in the country, the working class will have to ally itself with it, otherwise it will be crushed. But what is the nature of this alliance? In Russia, the working class, led by a revolutionary party, succeeded in winning the peasantry to the banner of socialism. In China, the Chinese Communist Party was forced by the Communist International to enter into an alliance with a bourgeois nationalist party, the Guomindang, which had, it, it, it had a mass membership amongst the peasantry. And so Stalin and others supporting this theory claimed it's therefore a peasant party. But at all times, its leadership represented the degenerate, weak Chinese bourgeoisie and landowning classes. They represented the same class interests as Kerensky and Kornilov in Russia. And the proof of that occurred in 1927, when Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Guomindang, massacred thousands of communists. The communists then allied with a left split from the Guomindang, who then mass massacred even more communists. Now, one might ask, was, does that mean that the Russian Revolution wasn't, uh, Russia wasn't ready for socialism in 1917? This was the argument the Russian Mensheviks made against the seizure of power. And in the end, the Comintern was putting forward a similar line in China. How, how can we wrap our heads around this seemingly absurd contradiction? They are unified by the method and the mentality of the Stalinist bureaucracy, an incredibly narrow empiricism, something Trotsky described as the worship of the accomplished fact. I mean, by the time Stalin came to power, the so socialist revolution had already taken place in Russia. It was a fact. Therefore, the socialist revolution was possible in Russia. However, the socialist revolution had not yet taken place in China, which I also accept as a fact. Therefore, the, China, the socialist revolution in China could not take place because it hadn't already happened. And this blind method led to mistake after mistake after mistake. So in fact, this was an abandonment, not just of the internationalist program, but of the Marxist philosophical method itself of Marxism. Their, their method was the world revolution has been pushed back. Therefore, we will build socialism without it. World revolution is abandoned. The reintroduction of the market has increased production. Therefore, we will build socialism through the market. And this policy of building socialism through the market led to another crisis. From 1927, the wealthy pe peasants that Stalin and Bukharin had been encouraging to enrich themselves made it clear that they had much more of an interest in further developing the market towards capitalism than submitting to a socialist planned economy. They started to withhold their product and the blind bureaucracy just turned 180 degrees from socialism at a tortoise pace to the forced collectivization of the land and the liquidation of the kulaks, the wealthy peasants, as a class. And from an extremely timid and gradual industrial policy, the Stalinist bureaucracy set the goal of achieving the five-year plan in four years. But this raises another question. If almost all the land was collectivized, did this, did, did, did this not mark a turning point where you could speak of socialism being built in, so, in the Soviet Union? And I think to answer this, we have to ask the question, what is socialism? As I said, it's the name commonly given to what Marx called the first phase of communism, the most basic principle of which is the abolition of private property. And Lenin gives a very brief description of socialism um, in State and Revolution, his masterpiece. The means of production belong to the whole of society. Every member of society, performing a certain part of the socially necessary work, receives from the public store of consumer goods a corresponding quantity of products. Remember that this is a communist society that has only just come into being out of capitalism. It cannot produce the abundance required for people to take whatever they need and whatever they want. And until that period, what Marx calls the higher stage of communism arrives, Lenin writes that the socialists demand the strictest control by society and by the state over the measure of labor and the measure of consumption. But, and I think this is a crucial line in State and Revolution, but this control must be exercised not by a state of bureaucrats, but by a state of armed workers. So strict control 
is the democratic and rational control over the wealth of society by the whole of the working class. Now, Stalin didn't immediately declare that the Soviet Union had become socialist in 1924. He acknowledged then that it was a transitional state, as Lenin described it as. But in 1935, the Seventh Con uh, Congress of the Communist International declared that the final and irrevocable triumph of socialism had arrived. In 1936, Molotov, who was the president of the Council of People's Commissars, the government in the Soviet Union, he said that they had solved the problem of the liquidation of classes. In other words, that the Soviet Union was a classless society. Because legally speaking, almost all of the land and all of industry was owned by the state. And this was also written into the constitution in 1936. But is the abolition of private property simply a legal question? If we take power and decree that all of the means of production are nationalized under the hands of the working class, which is our goal as communists, what happens if the material prerequisites, the level of production, is not high enough to make private property and commodity production redundant? Marx says that in conditions of scarcity, all the old crap, all the old scheisse, returns. So in 1936, when socialism had been irrevocably achieved, as in, you can't go back, 90% of farms in the Soviet Union were collectivized. At this time, two thirds of the population of the Soviet Union still lived on the land in the countryside. And despite collectivization, the majority of those peasants continued to uh, grow their products on small personal plots of land. That included, uh, there was a minority of peasants who only had personal plots, but then a significant layer of peasants on the collectivized farms also had their own personal plots. The reason was this, that they needed to do this to, pro to produce their means of subsistence because the productivity of the collectivized and state farms wasn't high enough to do that. If you nationalized all the agricultural land in Britain today, you'd be nationalizing gigantic industrial farms worked by workers. When they nationalized, collectivized almost all the land in the Soviet Union, they were nationalizing land worked with wooden plows using similar techniques from the Middle Ages. And socialist production, either in industry or the land, is impossible without a high level of development of the means of production and technique. And that can't just be written out of existence like a constitution. But what about in industry and the planned economy? Centralized economic plan is an essential part of the building of socialism. And in the USSR, starting from a low level, industrial development made enormous progress under the first two to five year plans. The economy grew by about 62 to 72% between 1928 and 1937. But no economic plan, however good, can magically create tools, raw materials and technique out of nothing. And so despite the impressive achievements of the first five-year plans, there remained many areas of the Soviet economy, economy where the low productivity of labor meant that the plan simply could not produce enough goods of a sufficient quantity to meet the needs of the working class. And by needs, I don't mean superabundance, like every imaginable need. I mean the basic needs, which is the point of socialism to meet, at the very least. So just give one statistic. On average, there was one shoe per person in the Soviet Union in 1935. Not one pair of shoes, one single shoe. The people in the upper levels of the bureaucracy had several pairs of shoes. So statistically speaking, there were still people walking around barefoot in a land where socialism had been irrevocably achieved. A Soviet professor of chemistry called Bach the, described the bread that was being consumed by the masses rather than by the elite as intolerably bad. This is another example of what Marx says, that in conditions of scarcity, all the old crap revives. This is why he explained that in order to establish communism, the highest possible level of development that's been acquired under capitalism is essential. And the high level of development under capitalism is precisely down to its international character. So in this con these conditions of scarcity, theft of consumer products and black markets became a common phenomenon. So what is this except the laws of the market beginning to assert themselves when the market had been formally abolished? This scarcity also led to extreme inequality. Because remember, this scarce product was not being distributed by a state of armed workers, but by a state of bureaucrats. In fact, part of the material basis of the bureaucracy was precisely the scarcity and inequality that existed within the Soviet Union, which then dialectically the bureaucracy intensified. Trotsky gives an interesting analogy of a bread line people queuing up for bread. He says that when a long bread line develops, a policeman or someone is required to make sure the line is in order. Everybody waits their turn. But the policeman always makes sure to eat first, doesn't he? And another example of all the old crap reviving. Under the constitution of the Soviet Union, the exploitation of man by man was abolished completely. But at least 5% of whole households in the Soviet Union had servants, household servants. 
the wealthiest Soviet citizens actually complained that the housing plan didn't provide them with enough rooms for their servants. There was a phenomenon of what was called millionaire collectives, agricultural collectives, in the countryside, which even unofficially let tenants, uh, let parts of land to, the, to tenants in return for rent. We can see in all of these phenomena the embryo of a potential capitalist restoration under the surface of socialist res relations that were in principle but not established entirely in fact. The point is that the nationalised planned economy, although essential for the construction of socialism, is not identical to it. It is only the foundation. In 1921, in fact several times, Lenin described the Soviet Union as a transitional regime, which was called socialism because it was striving towards socialism. Not that it had built it. And the very nature of a transitional regime is it can move forwards towards socialism or backwards towards capitalism. And actually you could say that in the Soviet Union it was doing both at the same time. The great contradiction at the heart of the Soviet Union right from the 1930s up until its collapse in the 90s is that the one, on the one hand it was developing the foundations of socialism through its development of the economy and planning. And at the same time it was um, preparing the way for the restoration of capitalism by building up an extremely privileged bureaucratic caste in society and through this persistent tendency towards private production and small property in the countryside. One of those two opposing tendencies ultimately had to win out. Either the spreading of the revolution to the advanced capitalist countries would liberate the Soviet Union from its isolation and backwardness, which, which would prepare the way for the, uh, the building of socialism in Russia, or the, uh, the embryo capitalist restoration would develop into the overthrow of the planned economy. But of course, the world revolution and the building of a, a healthy socialist regime in Russia was diametrically opposed to the privileges of the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy persistently presented its privileges as socialism. I have to move on, but they said things like, Marx explained that you'd still have inequality under socialism. That's true, he did say that. But I don't think Marx had in mind a situation in which the top of society lived in a comparable condition to the Western bourgeoisie, whereas at the bottom you had a fairly large layer of people without shoes or edible food. I think Marx and Engel and Lenin would have considered that a sick joke, a malicious caricature of socialism. And in practice, the more the bureaucracy identified its, its repulsive nature with socialism, the more it discredited socialism in the eyes of workers. But of course, the Soviet economy did develop beyond the 1930s. So I do want to deal with another question. If economic backwardness and a low level of development is the problem, is there not a tipping point, an absolute minimum by which you have enough industry to build socialism in one country? If we keep working, we keep planning, the workers work longer hours and so on. And I think we have to be clear, there is no such minimum tipping point. There is no tipping point like that. Let me give you an example. Britain in the 1920s did have the material prerequisites to build socialism. It was the most advanced capitalist country in the world. Without world revolution, it would have been strangled and crushed. But the economic basis for building socialism was present there. But could you build socialism in a country today with the machinery of the 1920s? I mean, why not? It worked then. Why wouldn't it work now? I think you can probably imagine what would happen. Assuming such a country weren't crushed by imperialist intervention, it would be utterly outcompeted and flooded with cheap commodities from the capitalist countries. We've seen many times in history that the working class is prepared to make incredible sacrifices to build socialism. But they're not stupid. They can see the difference in living standards between their country and the advanced capitalist countries. In fact, I, I read a, a Western pro bourgeois professor who visited the Soviet Union in the 1960s. And he wanted to talk to them about democracy, dictatorship, free speech. But they, they, all, all the workers asked him were, do workers in America have enough to eat? Is it true that every American has a car? And so on. What clothes are, are American women wearing? That kind of thing. It's not because the Soviet workers were greedy and desperate to have as many cars as possible, because they were seeing the contradiction between what they were told about this socialist society of freedom and justice and then the horrendous imperialist countries. The point is that in order to survive, the, the socialist state or states must outcompete the rest of the capitalist world. And how can even a huge country with a wealth of natural resources outcompete the, the rest of the entire planet in the world economy? As I said before, a big part of the reason for the high level of productivity under capitalism is its international and interconnected nature. To confine an economy to national boundaries that have already become redundant under capitalism means to confine the building of socialism to a lower level of development than capitalism. For this reason, Lenin and Trotsky predicted many times that without the World Revolution, the USSR would eventually succumb to world capitalism. 
This was, de this was decried, condemned as counter-revolutionary by the Stalinists. You were un they were, uh, and what Stalin said explicitly was, if it wasn't possible to build socialism in Russia, then the Bolsheviks shouldn't have taken power. Therefore, it must be possible, because the Bolsheviks had taken power. You can see why Stalin actually played no role whatsoever in the seizure of power, can't you? <laughs> Look, let's call this what this is. This is Menshevism. The economy in this nation is too backward to build socialism, therefore the workers mustn't take power. The fact the economy on a world scale is, if anything, overripe for socialism doesn't matter. We just look at our, my nation, as Lenin was saying. And so if it's too soon for the workers to take power, then someone has to, else has to rule. And why not the bourgeoisie or the landlords? And if that means the workers have to be disarmed and crushed and placed under a, a military dictatorship, then that's a shame. But it can't be helped. We couldn't have done any better because our country wasn't ready for socialism yet. Now, how can this kind of corrosion of Menshevik, Menshevism in the Communist Party be explained? It represents an ingrained lack of faith in the working class, first of all, but more importantly, a fear of the working class and the masses. Because a workers' revolution in another country represents a risk from the standpoint of the Soviet bureaucracy at this time. If the workers in one of the advanced capitalist countries establish a healthy workers' regime, that would have inspired the workers in the Soviet Union, but I'm sure they would have also compared the workers' regime in whatever other country, Germany or France, with their own. So it was always Im imperative that the building of socialism was as associated as closely as possible with the party, with a capital P. And by the ta this time, the party had become completely identical with the state bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. So the tasks of the World Socialist Revolution were now reduced to the calculations of the state planning authority of the Soviet Union. And you can see why that was safe, that was comfortable from the standpoint of the Soviet bureaucracy. Because they're in control, well, they think they're in control of the state planning authority of the Soviet Union. And what about the workers? They've already carried out the revolution, they've done their bit. Their job now is to work hard, exceed their targets, and be grateful. But this caused not just the spread of Menshevism within the, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, but across the entire Communist International. Because think about it, if socialism can be irreversibly established in the Soviet Union, the urgent objective need to spread the revolution is removed. Irreversible socialism means capitalism can't be restored. Revolution in, the, in other countries, and particularly the advanced capitalist countries, is just a, a favourable circumstance, not something to fight and make sacrifices and die for. Stalin expressed it well in an interview with someone called Roy Howard in 1936. He said, the idea of exporting revolution is nonsense. Every country, if it wants one, will produce its own revolution. And if it doesn't, there will be no revolution. Again, the flawless logic of Stalinism again. You can't argue with that. If there is a revolution, there will be a revolution. He continues, thus, for instance, our country wanted to make a revolution and made it. I seem to remember not all of Russia wanted to make a revolution in 1917, but I'm just going to repeat a quote from Lenin that I used earlier, if you don't mind. I must argue not from the point of view of my or our country, which is the argument of a wretched, stupid, petty bourgeois nationalist, but from the point of view of my share in the preparation, the propaganda, and acceleration of the world proletarian revolution. And in this way, the Comintern was converted from this instrument of the World Socialist Revolution, for which it was founded, into an instrument of so Soviet diplomacy, which was reduced to the interests of the bureaucracy in particular. And so, in, in Spain, for instance, in the Spanish Revolution, the Civil War, the workers rose up and started democratically controlling production in the factories. The peasants started seizing and collectivizing their own villages in some places. But the Stalinist bureaucracy that dominated the Comintern, which had recently collectivized its own peasants by force, stopped them and at times even shot them because it was necessary to maintain the popular front with the anti-fascist bourgeoisie. Unfortunately, Spain was not yet ready for socialism because the socialist revolution hadn't already taken place. And so unfortunately, Spain would have to go through the experience of fascism. And the great, well, that on its own is a great tragedy, but an, another part of this tragedy is this diplomacy with English and French imperialism isolated the USSR even further. Only a successful revolution in another European country could have prevented the Nazis from invading the Soviet Union. So far from protecting the worker state, the nationalist outlook of the, the Soviet bureaucracy actually made it more vulnerable. But another question you might be thinking is, okay, but after the Second World War, didn't socialism spread to many other countries? So wouldn't that be enough to build socialism? And it's true that the, the defeat of fascism by the Red Army proved in practice the superiority and incredible potential of the planned economy and the resilience of the masses of the Soviet Union to defend the gains of the October Revolution. 
And as the Red Army moved in and liberated countries from the, the, the Nazi army, the capitalists in countries like Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia, who had been collaborating with the Nazis, fled because they were terrified, not of the Red Army, but their own workers. And so in these conditions, in, in, in 1948, capitalism was overthrown uh, in these countries, um, basically by order of the bureaucracy, but with the support of the masses in those countries. I don't have time to go into it. But in addition to that, you had a wave of revolutions. Yugoslavia, they overthrew capitalism in, in Yugoslavia. In Italy, the partisans were the armed bodies of men in the country. They were the force, the power. And the communists were the most powerful force in the partisans. They could have taken power. In France, the communists led the resistance. In Greece, you had an eruption of a civil war between revolutionary partisans and fascists supported by British and American imperialism. In India, you had a, a, a mass movement, a revolutionary movement against imperialism. And of course, you had the Chinese Revolution in 1949. The world revolution had arrived at last. But in one of the greatest tragedies in human history, it was deliberately betrayed by the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. First of all, the Communist International was actually dissolved in 1943, without even a Congress, by the order of Stalin, who at that time was an ally of, uh, uh, the, uh, of uh, the US and British imperialism, and didn't want to provoke them with the threat of world revolution. He also said something interesting about the dissolution of the Communist International. He said there was something abnormal, something unnatural about the very existence of a general communist forum. At a time when the communist parties, these are his words, the communist parties should have been searching for a national language and fighting under the conditions prevailing in their own countries. I'd repeat that quote by Lenin about petty bourgeois nationalists, but I think I'm running out of time, I better not. You get the picture, don't you? But everywhere, the accommodation of the communist parties to their own national conditions always meant accommodation to their own national bourgeoisie. Rather than taking power, the communists entered into capitalist governments in France and Italy. They helped to stabilize the situation for capitalism. And then the imperialists pushed them out of the government because they'd already done their job, haven't they? In Greece, the Soviet Union sold out the Greek revolution in order to make a deal with Britain and the USA. Yeah. Stalin said, the uprising can never work. Britain and America would never accept it. He said explicitly, it must be stopped. But if you stop fighting a war against fascists, what do the fascists do? Do they stop as well? Greece wasn't ready for socialism, but there wasn't else, anything else we could do. So the Greek masses also will have to go through fascism. In fact, Stalin actually told Mao to come to an agreement with the nationalists, with the Guomindang that he was fighting. But luckily we might say Mao didn't listen to Stalin and he took power anyway. And Stalin later admitted, they were right, I was wrong. The socialist revol the revolution was possible because it had taken place. Now, this, co this counter-revolutionary position just does not make sense from any Marxist standpoint. But it does make sense from the standpoint of socialism in one country. It does, genuinely. What does the revolution in Greece matter when the USSR is actually moving towards communism? The highest stage of communism. And if the USSR, uh, USSR gets there, then eventually socialism will spread all around the world because it will be the most powerful economy in the world. The priority is protect the USSR. And along that theme, they actually changed the anthem of the, the national, national, the state anthem of the Soviet Union from the Internationale, which is the anthem of the world working class and the world communist movement, our anthem, changed it to a song which went, long live our Soviet motherland. In 1977, the, 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 the anthem was changed again in 1977. And it was improved as follows. Sing to the motherland, home of the free. Bulwark of peoples in brotherhood strong. Now, in his lifetime, Marx actually said that the idea of the brotherhood of peoples was worse than bourgeois free trade. Because at least bourgeois free trade um, fosters the interpenetration of nations. This reflected a period where in 1960, the, the uh, Soviet bureaucracy put out a new policy of peaceful coexistence. They explained that socialism had already been achieved in what they called the world socialist system, because you had other socialist states now, that full the highest stage of communism would be achieved in the Soviet Union by 1980, at which point it would overtake the United States and its economic pull would peacefully introduce socialism everywhere. Therefore, the sole priority of the world workers' movement is peace between the United States and the Soviet Union. The workers in the advanced capitalist countries, where potentially you'd have the basis for socialism, they had to ally with the anti-imperialist bourgeoisie, whoever they are, as part of a broad mass peace movement to prevent nuclear war, pacifism. And whilst preaching pacifism with US imperialism, troops from the Soviet Union and the Chinese People's Republic were shooting each other over a border dispute, and the Soviet Union was trying to assassinate the leader of the Yugoslav 
state. So peaceful coexistence within capitalism and violent conflict within socialism. But again, this makes sense from the standpoint of socialism in one country. The question had become, who is to lead in the construction of communism? And it was very important to the Soviet bureaucracy that it was the Soviet Union that was leading the way to communism. Because any alternative model that was being put forward was a threat at home. Meanwhile, you also had a wave of revolutions in the colonially oppressed countries all over the world. The World Revolution was back again. In all of those countries, the communists supported a, a, a popular front with the colonially oppressed bourgeoisie, the colonial bourgeoisie. And when in some of these countries, actually, the movement went further than the Stalinists actually wanted and overthrew capitalism, what was created was really a, a miniature version of the Soviet bureaucracy. Um, often on an even, uh, well, usually on an even lower technical basis. In the end, the and abandonment of world revolution meant the abandonment of revolution anywhere. And if we don't need the communist parties to carry out revolutionaries, um, revolution, sorry, why should they have a revolutionary program? What does it matter? A bad theory always leads to bad practice. Trotsky predicted that socialism in one country would eventually lead to the national reformist degeneration of the entire communist international. And we've seen this shameful degeneration take place around the entire world. In the United States, the Communist Party consistently supports the Democratic Party, a party of US imperialism. During the Algerian uprising against French imperialism, both the French and Algerian Communist Parties called the protesters Nazi sympathizers. In South Africa, the Communist Party has been in government with the ANC for 30 years. But South Africa still isn't ready for socialism. After 30 years of shared rule with, with the Communist Party, still not ready for socialism, we must complete the National Democratic Revolution. But they say we can, start, we can start preparing for socialism by encouraging the informal sector. Because that's workers providing workers with their needs. We mean, you know, like informal street markets and stuff like that. In Britain, we, every country now has its own special road to socialism. The Communist Party of Britain has Britain's road to socialism. Which is, and I think I'm quoting directly from memory, the election of a left-wing government. Not a socialist government, a left-wing government. And the job of the working class is to elect this government, to defend it against the attacks of the capitalists. And then, when at last, Britain is ready for socialism, we might just get it. But don't hold your breath. These parties abandon revolution everywhere. They abandon communism. They abandon the working class. And with this, they lost their reason to exist. And a party that doesn't have a reason to exist has no right to exist. And we've seen this verdict of history carried out in many countries. In Italy, where we're meeting, there was once the biggest communist party in the whole of Europe. But in 1989, it was dissolved by its own leadership because the collapse of the Soviet Union, the crisis of Stalinism, meant that there's no point fighting for socialism anymore. Again, the Stalinist method. Socialism exists already, therefore we should fight for socialism. Socialism no longer exists, therefore we should no longer fight for socialism. In the end, Trotsky and Lenin's pred prediction that the Soviet Union, if, if, if it were, uh, remained isolated, would be overwhelmed by world capitalism has been confirmed to the letter tragically. Socialism in one country has resulted in socialism nowhere. But the possibility for the building of socialism has never been greater in the whole of world history. In this new period of world revolution, we must build a world party capable of leading that revolution. We must build a revolutionary communist international. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Josh. This was an excellent in, uh, introduction. And I'm sure you're all pretty uh, motivated to get more into the topic now. So um, the first speaker will be um, Juan from uh, Colombia. At the uh, Revolutionary Communist International, we defend the Cuban Revolution unconditionally. It is one of the most important events in the history of the American continent. Within two years and a half, the guerrillas led by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara abolished capitalism and expropriated the bankers and the bosses who were backed by American imperialism. However, the reality is that this revolution was accomplished by a petty bourgeois guerrilla. At first, Fidel Castro and his followers were at loggerheads with the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. A natural distrust emerged after events like the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was negotiated and settled by Nikita Khrushchev with the United States without discussions with the Cubans. 
And here you really see how the USSR saw the nations that attempted to build, that attempted to build socialism. Even after the death of Stalin, the mentality of the bureaucracy was to treat these countries as if they were small change. This distrust flowed from the perspective of its uh, sorry, this distrust, distrust of the uh, Fidel Castro and his guerrillas flowed from their perspective at the time of exporting the Cuban Revolution, <coughs> which guided Che Guevara's decision to travel to Bolivia. However, the fact is that the Cuban Revolution had to start where the Russian Revolution ended. That is to say, after their confrontation with American imperialism, they had to rely on the Soviet Union economically. And this eventually brought the Cuban bureaucracy under control. Which, it must be said, outside of certain outspoken elements like Che Guevara, who deplored the Cuban bureaucracy explicitly and said it had failed to bring workers into uh, democratic control of production. The Cuban bureaucracy had no interest in fighting for workers' control. The reason for this was due to the nature in which the Cuban revolution had taken place, of course. It was a self-admitted, petty bourgeois-led guerrilla and was not able to create organs of workers' control or democracy. And so in order to defend their interests, they had to ally themselves with the USSR and therefore adopt the Soviet model of planet, planning. A model that fit, uh, fit the needs of the layer of bureaucrats around Fidel Castro. And this was reflected in the way Cuba approached the relations to countries in Latin America. In Nicaragua, for instance, Fidel openly advised the Sandinistas to not follow the path of the Cuban revolution and advised against land reform and wide uh, land expropriations. In Chile, uh, rather famously during the days of Allende, uh, Fidel gave Salvador Allende a machine gun sign. But he had nothing to say on the brewing coup by American imperialism or how to organize the Chilean workers to fend it off. Even though he had plenty of experience in fending off the CIA during the Bay of Pigs invasion. I'd say perhaps worse of all, Fidel supported the deployment of tanks against the Czechoslovakian uprising that tried to bring about workers' democracy. And I will argue this is all bitterly ironic when you really think about it. Because the two most prosperous periods of the Cuban revolution were intimately linked to revolutions abroad. For instance, the support of the USSR in Cuba made a planned economy truly possible. On very favorable terms, it must be said. Massive loans were given for 25 years with no interest. Oil was exchanged for sugar at favorable rates to the Cubans. In fact, you could say that without this agreement, uh, socialism will not have survived through the special period and the fall of the USSR, as a matter of fact. The other example was, of course, the Bolivarian Revolution, which, if you will, was able to refuel the Cuban Revolution for a relatively short period of time. And rather tellingly, it also reignited the interests of Cuban workers and peasants in international politics. And they started to discuss even how to develop the Cuban Revolution further. I visited Cuba once, as a matter of fact, a Medicaid driver. He told me that he had seen the Cuban Revolution at its very best. He provided him with health care, a university education in chemistry, and the opportunity to travel the world. However, now he was working as a cab driver rather than as a professor at a university as he originally used to. Just talk about how workers can see the different living conditions between a worker state struggling to build socialism 
and life in the developed capitalist countries. <laughs> and, and you really see it in, in a person like him. And it helps you understand the context of the Cuban revolution right now. We must be clear, the Cuban revolution finds itself under siege at the moment. And Cuban workers throughout 60 years have given everything they got in order to defend the revolution. However, the precondition for the Cuban revolution to truly move forward is a ruthless and relentless fight against the blockade imposed by American imperialism. And that fight cannot be waged by Cuban workers alone. It must be waged by all workers internationally who must settle accounts with their own bourgeoisie and their interests in putting pressure on the island. And in that way, sorry. And in that way, attempt to restore capitalism. These are the means by which we defend the Cuban revolution. Thank you. Um, next speaker will be Keelan from the British section, and after that, uh, Ian. I Ian? So I gave a talk on the on was the USSR communist two years ago. I'll save you 45 minutes, it wasn't. But in that talk I made the point that the USSR never reached socialism and could never do so with its isolation. And a witty Stalinist commented on the YouTube video, it didn't remain isolated, the revolution spread to many countries. Fair enough, I learned a lesson in the need to be precise. But I want to actually address this question now. Because it is true that capitalism was expropriated across Eastern Europe at the end of the Second World War. But this was not like Russia in 1917. There were mass movements of workers and peasants that erupted as the Red Army approached that effectively dismantled the old bourgeois regimes that fled uh, with the Nazis. Power rested in the hands of the masses. In most uh, countries, Soviets were even formed. But the only communist organizations present were those taking orders from Moscow. And so the workers were told to patiently await their liberation and to focus on mopping up with the fascists. And so the Red Army arrived and immediately imposed military rule. At once, the excesses of the workers and peasants were curbed. Expropriations of land and factories uh, that were the initiative of the workers were halted and often reversed. And despite having full control of the situation with the Red Army occupying everywhere, the Stalinists ordered the communists to establish popular front governments everywhere. Reformers' parties were often folded into the communist parties. In East Germany, for example, the KPD was merged with the SDP to form uh, the Socialist Unity Party, the SED. And beyond this, these bureaucratically merged parties form coalitions with peasant parties and bourgeois liberal ones. The Stalinist excuse for this was that the communist parties were weak and small. True, the KPD was a tiny force, thanks to the Stalinist policies that allowed Hitler to come to power. And true, the Polish communists were weak and disorganized, following Stalin's decision to dissolve the Com Polish Communist Party in 1938. But events in Czechoslovakia reveal that this is false, this defense of the Stalinists. Here the communists had immense authority with the Czech workers. The communist party, the KSC, won the most votes in the 1946 election. Yet the KSC only demanded two certain ministries, the Ministry of the Interior and the Ministry of Defense. Some limited reforms were granted, but capitalism remained in place. And this was despite the popularity of the KSC and the desire of the workers uh, to achieve a socialist transformation. But this was not a case of political timidity or vacillation. It was deliberate and calculated. The Stalinists were aware of the immense enthusiasm amongst the masses and were extremely wary of their initiative. The development of a popular front government was designed to be disorienting and demobilizing. Far from raising the sights of the masses, the KSC attempted to limit their horizons. Gottwald, the initial post-war leader of the KSC, claimed in 1945, in spite of the favorable situation, the next goal is not Soviets and socialism, but rather carrying out a really thorough democratic revolution. So the Popular Front in Czechoslovakia was in many ways therefore no different to any other. Its aims were to channel the aspirations of the masses into preserving the status quo. But there was a crucial difference from Spain and France in the 1930s. In those societies, the bourgeois and bourgeois property relations still dominated and the workers were dragged behind them by the Stalinists. But in Czechoslovakia, capitalism was effectively put on life support by the USSR. Even more than in Spain, it was the shadow of the bourgeois in government. 
Most capitalists had fled with the Nazis, fearful of reprisals. The openly capitalist parties were detested by the masses and had no real authority. With the Stalinists firmly in control of the situation, they were able to sweep aside this rotten capitalism with bureaucratic methods. To recreate the Soviet regime in Prague, whereby capitalism was expropriated, but the workers held no political power. So it was that the KSC was able to effect a coup d'etat in 1948. Using their control of the army and the police, combined with the mass support they mobilized but tightly controlled, forming action committees which were under the strict control of the party. The seizure of power was thus a process of parliamentary maneuvers that saw non-KSC ministers squeezed out and the consolidation of a government uh, completely controlled by the KSC. Czechoslovakia was only a glaring example of how the Stalinists came to power in Eastern Europe. Not through leading a mass movement of the working class and peasantry, but by installing bureaucratic regimes utterly subservient to Moscow. The policies p pursued by the Soviets in Eastern Europe were completely criminal. Many of these countries, having fought against the USSR in the war, were subject to brutal reparations. In East Germany, 33% of its industrial plant and $10 billion worth of goods were extracted. 10 billion. In Hungary, 22% of its GDP went to paying reparations to the USSR in the 1940s. And in Romania, on top of $300 million worth of war reparations, the Soviets stole over $2 billion worth of goods through uh, so-called joint enterprises. It is testament to the potential of economic planning that despite this systematic looting, Eastern Europe grew more quickly than Western Europe in the 1950s. Perhaps the biggest crime th uh, that the Stalinists committed, however, was the rigid maintenance of all of these small nation states and the attempt to create independent economies planning within the national boundaries, only linked by trade and in a much more limited way than the West. So you had the absurd spectacle of these tiny nations allocating their own limited resources to the plan and each one investing enormously in the exact same heavy industries that were built up elsewhere. This undoubtedly stifled their development and produced all sorts of absurd waste and inefficiency. In East Germany, there was an extremely limited supply of various metals. So the state car company produced its car, the Trabant, with a new plastic it invented called Duroplast. Remarkably, they made this from discarded cotton waste from the USSR. So the Soviets were willing to sell the DDR waste, but not steel and iron, which it was the leading producer of in the world. So East Germany sank huge sums of money into the development of this material, which today is no longer produced. This is, the, uh, this is only one example, but there are many others that reveal the absurdity of socialism in one country and hi highlight to us again that socialism in one country in fact meant socialism in no country. So before, before, before uh, Ian comes in, there is a, a question of a comrade. You have a bit of time to bring her in. Hi, comrades. Um, my question was about North Korea. Um, I have a contact. Oh, I'll pause. <laughs> uh, I have a contact who is very interested in North Korea, and um, I find it hard to find information that seems trustworthy about it. Uh, so. <laughs> So I wondered if some comrades in the room might have an extensive knowledge on the topic that they could share. <laughs> Thank you. After Ian, uh, Nikola from uh, Yugoslavia. Thank you and hello everyone. I uh, don't know anything about North Korea so I won't touch on that. Uh, uh, but I think hearing about the reports from Kashmir it should remind us all why we're here and why we talk about ideas like this. Because ultimately, questions of revolutionary theory determine what tactics we can take and therefore whether movements like theirs can succeed. Leon Trotsky developed the theory of permanent revolution, which explains how revolutions develop in backwards countries like Kashmir. To put it perhaps over simplistically, in these countries, the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution have not been completed. But the comprador bourgeoisie is not able to carry them out themselves, and so only the working class remains to carry out these tasks. When they do, they won't stop there, but will carry on to the tasks of the socialist revolution. And to develop socialism in these countries, the revolution must spread internationally to the advanced capitalist countries where the basis for socialism already exists. Now, Trotsky was a genius, but he didn't randomly develop this theory. He was working in the conditions of backwards Russia and was able to generalize from that particular experience the theory of permanent revolution. 
But all around the world, Marxist revolutionaries came to similar conclusions on these questions. One such example is James Connolly from Ireland. He died in 1916, and the ideas of communism really got a grip in the, the movement in Ireland in the 60s. What this meant was that the legacy of Connolly was distorted by the ideas of Stalinism, which had become dominant. So I'd like to explain a bit what he really stood for. Firstly, on the question of whether the revolution could be purely national, on this we see the Stalinists agreeing with our own Irish bourgeoisie that it would be carried out in Ireland with the petty bourgeoisie or the progressive democratic bourgeoisie. In reality, this was not further from Connolly's real position. Connolly had nothing but hatred for this petty bourgeoisie, as he put it in his own words. After Ireland is free, says the patriot who won't touch socialism, we will protect all classes. And if you won't pay your rent, you will be evicted, same as now, but the evicting party, under the command of the sheriff, will wear green uniforms and the harp without the crown. And the warrant turning you out onto the roadside will be stamped with the arms of the Irish Republic. Now, isn't that worth fighting for? I think the point he makes is very clear. To complete these bourgeois democratic tasks, you need to win over the masses of the population, and you can't do that by offering them Irish capitalism instead of British capitalism. You have to overthrow the whole capitalist system. This is completely alien to any of these petty bourgeois ideas, and also to the idea that there must be a democratic stage in the socialist revolution. But then, the Stalinists may argue, instead of arguing for stages, Connolly wanted socialism just in Ireland. But this is just as alien to his works and writing. Connolly was a staunch internationalist who had been involved in the labor movement in Scotland, in Ireland, and in America. He was also a member of the Second International. And in 1914, alongside the Bolsheviks uh, and the Serbian Marxists, he stood alone in opposing the imperialist slaughter of World War I and was caught completely unawares by the betrayal of the Second International. Similarly to Lenin, Trotsky, and all of the genuine internationalists, and again, to quote him from the time, he said, What then becomes of all our resolutions, all our protests of fraternization, all our threats of general strikes, all our carefully built machinery of internationalism, all our hopes for the future? Were they all as sound and fury, signifying nothing? And of course, in 1916, Connolly led the Easter Rising. But this was far from an attempt to build an isolated Irish socialist republic, but it served as a beacon to the workers of the world and a call for revolution. After all, Connolly wasn't an idiot, and he never believed that on their own, a small group of rebels would be able to defeat the entire British Empire. <coughs> so I think there's one last quote from Connolly, which shows how close his thinking was to that of Leon Trotsky. He says, the cause of labor is the cause of Ireland, and the cause of Ireland is the cause of labor. They cannot be dissevered. Okay. <laughs> the point he makes is crystal clear. The cause of labor, the cause of socialism, is entirely connected to the cause of a free Ireland, of national liberation. National liberation can only be won through the struggle for socialism. And of course, the workers fighting for socialism must break the link with British imperialism, and construct not an Irish capitalist state where they're still dominated, but a workers' republic run by themselves. Of course, it was obvious to all of the genuine Marxists that this could only be accomplished on the basis of a world revolution. And of course, this is identical to the theory of permanent revolution, only in that Trotsky, or only in that Connolly didn't develop it into a general theory, but as it applied to Ireland. And that Connolly wasn't able to draw these general conclusions in 1916, even before Lenin had come to this position, only speaks to the brilliance of Leon Trotsky. But even still, with just the seeds of these ideas, Connolly towers above the Stalinist distortions of Marxist theory. And so I would say that there's still so much for revolutionaries to learn from his ideas and his writings, 
And in that, I highly recommend comrades read Alan Wood's uh, Ireland, Republicanism and Revolution, which I'm informed uh, Well Read have already sold out of here. So <laughs> good job. But I can say confidently that the ideas of Stalinism will play no role in the coming Irish Revolution, and that instead, revolutionaries in Ireland are looking back to the genuine ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, and of James Connolly. And with those ideas, we will move forwards to a 32-county workers' republic. Apologies, didn't realize I didn't translate so well. <laughs> uh, to the Irish Revolution as a part of the World Socialist Revolution. Thank you. So after Nicola, I will bring in Owen from the British section. Hello, comrades. Great subject. So I would love to say something about the case of Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav uh, Communist Party was Stalinized during the 1930s. It went to a terrible process of Stalinization and uh, purchases. And at the end, with a man set up, set from Moscow as the leader of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, that went by the name Josip Broz Tito. Prior to the Second World War, the Yugoslav Communist Party has adopted the theory of socialism in one country. It took up the role of the Communist Party in Yugoslavia was to defend the Soviet Union. A revolution in Yugoslavia was impossible. But then came the Second World War and the Yugoslav Royal Army was defeated. The Communist Party had also adopted the strategy of Popular Front, which till that time has failed in China, but also in its application on the Balkans, which led to the slaughter of communists in Macedonia and Bulgaria in the 1920s. But there was only one problem. The most of the national bureau, uh, bourgeoisies in Yugoslavia has already started to collaborate. What was left was only the remains of the royal army in Serbia, the Chetniks. So the partisan movement started collaborating with the Chetniks in an uprising in 41 that led to forming the People's Republic of Užice. And guess what the Chetniks did? They slaughtered the partisans together with the German troops. I mean, Tito was a Stalinist, but he was a clever guy. When he saw that the partisans got slaughtered, he decided to change tactics and apply the tactics of class war. This has made the revolution in Yugoslavia possible. The working class in Yugoslavia took the task and fought for their liberation. But still, Stalinism is Stalinism. And after the end of the war, the Stalinists have applied the same policies as in the Soviet Union. They took power, but their main task was to defend the interests of the socialism in Yugoslavia in the shape of the interests of the bureaucracy that was forming in Yugoslavia. But this bureaucracy had the power to say no to Stalin. Then you need some new ideas. And there were, if, there, if socialism in one state is possible and Yugoslavia has specific uh, material conditions, then the Yugoslav will have their own path to socialism, which actually just facilitated market reforms but the market reforms were called workers' self-management. Nor it was workers, nor it was management. It was only several factories who were competing in the socialist, ma socialist market. This has developed a different interests in the bureaucracies in Yugoslavia. But the answer was more market reforms through to the Yugoslav path of socialism. And then the Bonapartist dies and the bureaucracy starts to compete between each other. But they need now nationalism, and it led to a bloodshed of the, of the working class in Yugoslavia, in which, in which the Yugoslav working class will, was defeated in the most horrible manner. So these ideas of socialism in one state are a dangerous idea for the working class movement, and we have a role to explain that the working class movement, it it should be internationally does fight for a world revolution. But this idea also has played a role in the possible spreading of the revolution from Yugoslavia, mainly to Italy and Greece. The Greek Communist Party fought in a civil war. It was betrayed by Stalin, but then the Yugoslav bureaucracy decided that they should protect their own path to socialism and closed the border 
between Yugoslavia and Greece, which has left the partisan fighters in northern Greece with the necess necessary help in medical services and any kind of a help. Tito also forced them to be defeated. And this has ruined the possibility of Balkan Socialist Federation, something that could have sparkled a revolution in Europe too. So for us understanding that we fight for a world revolution, it's from of a crucial importance for, for the victory of the working class. And that is why we are bu building a revolutionary communist international. Our struggle is not a revolution in our country. Our struggle is a world revolution. And this international is building the forces so that this time the world revolution can be possible. Thank you. Uh, after, after Owen, we have a, another question from uh, Comrade Franz. Hello, uh, I'm Owen from the British section. I w wanted to talk about the role of the Comintern in the Chinese Communist Party. At the turn of the 20th century, the working class movement in China was young and very small. Yet what they lacked in size, they made up for in courage and determination. And it would not be long before the young forces of Chinese communism would be thrown into revolutionary events. Now, the events of the Russian Revolution had a profound effect on the Chinese working class. In 1919, the Soviet government relinquished Chinese territories that had been stolen by the Tsar. This was in sharp contrast to the meddlings of the imperialists who sought to carve up China. In the same year, Shen Dushu began publishing the New Youth magazine that introduced the ideas of Marxism to Chinese workers and youth for the first time. This was the very beginnings of the communist movement in China. But if we fast forward a couple of years, the Chinese Communist Party was officially founded in 1921. Now the party was founded with only 50 members. But despite its small size, they had an enormous advantage. And that advantage was of course the experience of the Russian Revolution. The Communist International had been formed to guide the forces of communism and revolution around the world. And at first, the Comintern used its authority and its resources to help guide the young party. For example, Shen Dushu advocated for a loose party structure. But through extensive discussions with the Comintern, Shen and the rest of the party were convinced on the need for a Bolshevik organization. These were the methods of a healthy organization the methods of Marxism. Unfortunately, only a few years later, the Comintern would be under the firm grip of the Stalinists. Now, the CCP and the Chinese labor movement advanced at lightning pace over the next few years. And this came to a head in 1925. A militant wave of strike action uh, shook the nation. Revolution was on the table. This demonstrates that it is not the size of the working class that imbues them with their revolutionary potential. It is their role in production. The Chinese working class made up a tiny proportion of the population. Yet this strike wave was enough to totally paralyze society. Unfortunately, the Stalinist bureaucrats were not interested in turning this situation to their advantage. Reflecting their lack of faith in the working class, the Comintern instead suggested a disastrous strategy of merging with the Guomindang. As Josh outlined earlier, this was a bourgeois nationalist party. Now, this was a very crude interpretation of two-stage theory. It was essentially a Menshevik approach. The Comintern didn't believe that the CCP, the CCP could take power because China had not yet passed into a capitalist phase. And first, they must carry out the tasks of the bourgeois democratic revolution. Regardless of whether or not this was the case, the merger with the Guomindang was on a completely unprincipled basis. Let's compare this to Lenin's approach to the national question. In the draft theses on the national question, which can be found in the Indefensive Marxism magazine, Lenin says the working class should under all circumstances uphold the independence of the proletarian movement, even if it's in its most embryonic form. Now, uh, I don't uh, have time to go into um, the later events with the Guomindang, but needless to say, this unprincipled fusion 
uh, would prove completely disastrous. The Kuomintang bang, banned the communists from speaking about class struggle. They cut the communists off from the working class. In 1925, the Kuomintang took power in a coup and they set about the repression of the communists. Ultimately, the betrayals of the Stalinists would cost the Chinese communists thousands of lives. And this is why we build our international on the principle of world revolution and not petty nationalism. Thank you, comrades. So after Franz, uh, it's going to be Niklas. Yeah, thank you. I quickly wanted to ask if you or anyone else uh, could answer the following question. Could you explain a bit more in detail how, like, how the abandonment of genuine internationalism and the focus on nationalism leads to reformism? Why does the British way to socialism or a uh, road to socialism or the French road to socialism lead directly to the subordination of the communists and the, their own national bourgeoisie like, I don't know, like the SPD in 1914? And that, that not only in the, in the backward countries but also in the developed um, countries where like this two-stage theory at least shouldn't apply. I mean, it shouldn't apply anywhere, but I don't know. Yeah, that's my question. So uh, I don't have any more um, comrades on the list. So Niklas is going to be the last speaker before Josh uh, sums up the discussion. So yeah. Yeah. I want to start with one point regarding uh, the interest of the bureaucracy and how it links to socialism in one country. I think Josh explained quite well how uh, empirical the Soviet bureaucracy was. And you even kind of get it from Stalinists today. When, when, uh, whenever a revolution failed and you criticize the leadership, their response often is something along the lines of, well, it didn't happen, therefore the conditions weren't ready for it. As though it was, you know, because something didn't happen, then th it couldn't happen. It's an extremely fatalistic approach. Leaves no, basically no room for the party or for the subjective factor whatsoever. In which case, basically, there's no need for a communist party. There's no reason to build a communist party. And there's no reason for the working class to become conscious of its role in history. And speaking of consciousness... The bureaucracy in the first stages weren't conscious of its counter-revolutionary role, but it was merely acting, it was only its innate conservatism that was making it play a counter-revolutionary role. I mean, the leaders of, a, of the Third International, after uh, Lenin was dead and Trotsky had been outmaneuvered, were people like Sinoviev, Kamenev and Stalin, who in 1917 had opposed the October insurrection. Sinoviev and Kamenev openly, and Stalin behind the scenes in this typical manner. He refused to publish Lenin's appeals for the insurrection, and he was always very close with this wing of the party. So inevitably these people, when it comes to the point of having a Chinese October, or preparing the way for a Chinese October, they will obviously fall short. Because if they didn't understand the situation in 1917, why would they understand the situation in 1925? But the, over time, this changes. Uh, just as an aside, Sinoviev and Kamenev, they broke with Stalin in, I think, 1925 over the question of uh, socialism in one country. That was even a bit too much for those two. Who, although they were a little bit on the conservative side, and were overwhelmed by their own, the needs of their own personal egos rather than the needs of world revolution, they still held true to some, some of Lenin's memories, memory. But by, in the 1930s, basically, this unconscious uh, counter-revolutionary policy became conscious. And at this point, socialism in one country much more clearly becomes socialism in Russia and the capitalism elsewhere. Well, this wasn't really socialism, but what they called socialism. Because now you have a situation where uh, they're looking for a popular front to defend uh, uh, the Soviet Union against German invasion that everyone knew was on the cards. So they were looking for an alliance with Britain and France. And the Spanish Revolution got in the way. 
and S Stalin tried to prove his counter-revolutionary credentials by sabotaging the Spanish Revolution. And, and this was pretty open, that this was what they were doing. If you read Eric Kopsbaum's book on the 20th century history, it's, uh, he was, the, uh, it was like the official historian of the British Communist Party. Professor Frogsbaum, as they called him. <laughs> but if you read what he wrote about the Spanish Revolution, he said it was necessary to sacrifice the Spanish Revolution for the greater good. And so what you have here is a conscious counter-revolutionary policy to sacrifice the Spanish workers in the interest of defending socialism in Soviet Union. And what was Lenin's policy on the same, in a similar situation? What did he say about similar situations? He said he would sacrifice the Russian Revolution if it was meant the survival of the German Revolution or the victory of the German Revolution. Why? Because he was an internationalist. And he understood that the German Revolution would be so much more powerful and important because of the strength of the working class in Germany. At the advanced level of the productive forces in Germany that could help spread socialism across Europe. Now, what did Stalin get in return for sacrificing the Spanish Revolution? Well, the next thing that happened is that the West makes a pact with Hitler. They hand over the Czech Republic to Hitler. And Austria. And so Stalin realizes, oops. And so he makes a pact with Hitler. I mean, this is the way uh, Soviet diplomacy worked. And at every turn, there was a new sh order, come, a new telegram coming from Moscow. So the communist parties were always like, oh, what's the latest line? There's even a, there's even a story of a communist party, uh, uh, leader of the communist party of Britain, who had to change the line midway through a speech. <laughs> Someone passed him a note. Because they, they changed in 1934, 1938, and then 1941. From third period to popular frontism, back to third period, and then to popular frontism again. What was the common, what was the thread in this? The needs of the Soviet bureaucracy, as well as their incredibly empirical way of approaching foreign policy. Like it doesn't take a genius to figure that if you sacrifice the Spanish revolution, you're not gonna get any brownie points with the British, American and French imperialism. But the Soviet bureaucracy didn't approach the question in that way. They didn't have that kind of understanding. There was another reason why this conscious betrayal occurred. And that's at a certain stage, the Soviet bureaucracy started feeling that their strength was dependent on the world revolution. In an inverse way. That is, the more the revolution spread, the weaker they became. And the more confidence that, uh, the more the world revolution spread, the more confidence workers in the Soviet Union had, the more demands and the more pressure they were putting on the bureaucracy. And with every defeat of the revolution in China and so on, in Spain, that strengthened the bureaucracy. And in an empirical way, they found themselves realizing this. And so for their own, to preserve themselves, they also had an interest in keeping socialism, uh, well, in pushing for a counter-revolution abroad. The purges in the 19, late 1930s, uh, the first, the first uh, layer that got purged was the, the army, starting with those officers that had served in Spain, had served the, for, uh, the, the Soviet Union foreign policy in Spain, that had, be that had betrayed that revolution as Stalin's agents, but there's no, such thing as, there's no such thing as gratitude in politics. The bureaucracy was worried that some of the revolutionary virus might have affected these uh, generals and so on. 
And so the whole of the uh, commanding staff would have been involved, they were purged. There was also the fear that they might have some residual um, uh, loyalty to Trotsky, who had obviously been built up the Red Army. But, but when Hitler invaded in 1939, no, 1941, the whole of the Red Army's officer corps had been beheaded. And the people who were, had been put in charge were uh, the least, uh, what do you say, the most incompetent and least uh, uh, imaginative bureaucrats that had, could be found. And lots of the blunders that occurred in the first couple of years of the war are the fault of these uh, new layer of uh, military officers. I just realized, as Ro uh, Josh was talking as well, that on the question of, um, uh, you know, when you talk about, oh, the Soviet Union is going to uh, overtake US and then we'll spread communism that way. It's, today they're saying the same thing about China. <laughs> Except, of course, China is not even a deformed worker state. But, but they're effectively saying the stronger Chinese imperialism is, the stronger world communism is. And so the Stalinists now are even more at sea than they used to be. And one, but also, what, what's, what's consistent about their position is not to prepare revolution where they are, prepare the ground for revolution where they are, but to wait uh, uh, the savior for some, from somewhere else. There's one final uh, point I wanted to make. That is that the socialism in one country uh, inevitably led to a nationalist generation of all the uh, parties of a uh, communist international. And the abandonment of in proletarian internationalism in favor of reformism and, uh, what do you say, um, yeah, the comments I described it already. Um, yeah, I lost the word for it. <laughs> but basically, nas the nationalist gen generation still has its echo in, in the Stalinist parties today. The most blatant example is the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, who defends Putin, defends the war in Ukraine, thinks that the, the worst thing that has happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union is the loss of Russia's place in the world defends nationalization on the basis that it will create a stronger army. And it, the entire of its program is couched not in terms of the building of socialism or the promotion of the working class, but in terms of the Russian nation. But also all the Stalinist parties, they have this um, twitch uh, on the question of migration, for example, where they don't, uh, they don't accept workers coming from abroad as being proper workers. But basically, it's the British workers first, and this, the others can come later. On this question, they've abandoned internationalism and the proletarian internationalism completely. And instead, it's all about reformism. Well, the workers have achieved certain benefits under the capitalism in these countries, and this, these, wor these immigrants who put this under threat, is their logic. The... Uh, some uh, naughty Swedish comrades, they posted the article that we wrote about migration on the forum of the Swedish Communist Party. Well, then it talks about this attitude towards migration being one of the labor aristocracy. And they, uh, the, these guys were racking their brains trying to uh, explain how why Lenin was wrong, effectively. And they, they came up with uh, the, uh, the following line. Well, the thing was, in Lenin's time, the workers didn't really have anything to defend. They didn't really have a welfare state and so on. But now, of course, in Sweden, this was 2012 or something, we got the welfare state and so on. So we got something to defend. And therefore, we cannot be internationalist anymore effectively, is what they were saying. But I mean, in one degree or another, they've all succumbed to this. And it's not a, really an accident that they wound up dissolving themselves into the very social democratic parties. And they've abandoned all talk about revolution and so on. Um, because there's a clear link between these questions. 
a revolutionary attitude and revolutionary approach, internationalism on the one hand, and on the other hand, nationalism and reformism. Maintaining yourself within the framework of the national capitalist state, ke keeping the struggles limited to, to the existing framework of capitalism. What can be achieved within the framework, within the situation as it exists at the moment? If you read programs like The British Road to Socialism, it is like, uh, well, you, you might as well read the Social Democratic program, really. It's like, oh yeah, we're going to have a left government that becomes a bit more progressive, and then become a bit more progressive and a bit more left, and then with communists will become a little bit part of the government and become more part of the government, etc., etc. A completely evolutionary reformist uh, approach to the question. No sense of dialectics, uh, and also completely abstract. It says you, the left government should give reforms. <laughs> On what basis? This was written in 1977, in the middle of, well, one of them was written in 1977, in the middle of a capitalist crisis. And they were talking about, the, oh yeah, the left government should give, Labour, left Labour government should give reforms. With what money? It's just completely abstract uh, stuff. And no understanding of uh, capitalism, no understanding of the state. And basically they just uh, uh, become reformists. I'm not sure if that answers Frank's question. But I think it's part of the answer anyway. Okay, comrade, uh, I think it has been an excellent discussion. So Josh is uh, going to sum up the discussion now. But well, comrades, I think it's been a fascinating and very varied discussion, which has raised some very important points for us to take home. I'll, I'll try my best to respond to everything um, and answer the questions that have been asked to the best of my ability. I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Juan brought up the question of Cuba. I think it's a very important question. And one thing that really came across from his intervention is how actually the, the, the Cuban revolutionaries start with a, um, should we say, like a, a, an interna a gut feeling of internationalism, understanding, yeah, we need to, we're, we're on a small island, we need to export the revolution. Uh, going over to um, fight in colonial wars and revolutions in their thousands and dying in their thousands in places like Angola. But at the same time, there is also a, a, a degeneration taking place which is um, in part because of the influence and the, the deliberate pernicious influence of the Soviet Union politically, but so also rooted in the fact, as Juan already explained, that the regime was a product of a, 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 a peasant guerrilla war led by uh, originally petty bourgeois nationalists. And so when we look at the situation in Cuba more recently, we see just how much the revolution is in danger. I visited Cuba in 2017, where the economy was doing relatively well at that time, because of the Venezuelan revolution, the Bolivarian revolution. And in people's windows, you saw portraits of Chavez and Castro together. And there was a, uh, there was a spirit of uh, na internationalism, a sense that the Cuban revolution is a part of the revolution in Latin America more broadly. But what I also learned from that experience is it is possible to be internationalist in, in, in a nationalist way. And, and for, your, for your internationalist aspirations to become reduced to the brotherhood of nations that I talked about earlier. The, the Cuban bureaucracy told the Chavez regime and the, the, the United Socialist Party in, in Venezuela not to expropriate the ruling class, not to follow the Cuban model, which came, comes from the same conservative empiricism that I was discussing in relation to the Soviet Union. Keep a lid on things. Don't, prevent, uh, don't provoke Yankee imperialism too much. At the same time, in Cuba, the deal with Venezuela was presented as something permanent and actually something that made not just socialism, but communism irreversible. So erecting these gigantic hopes of finally, we've broken out of the special period, we're gonna have further progress, whilst undermining the very thing that could make the revolution irreversible. Of course, since then, the situation in Venezuela has declined. And the support, the, uh, the, the benefit that Cuba is getting out of its relations in, in Venezuela has also reduced. Rather than just gradually getting better and better, things have turned, turned worse in conditions of crisis. And, and the Cuban economy in is, a, is a, in a very parlous state, a perilous state for the future of the revolution. And here we see a, another problem, a big problem, with the theory of socialism in one country. Um, workers, young people, communists in Cuba have been told for decades that this is socialism. That can only serve to confuse the very revolutionaries that 
want to fight to save the revolution are being confused by the leadership. Um, more and more concessions to the market are being made in Cuba. Now, what was Lenin's method? When he made concessions to the market in the new economic policy in the 1920s, he was completely honest to the working class. And even more important, he was brutally honest with his own party. He said, this is a retreat, which contains the inherent inevitability of capitalist restoration if we don't break our isolation. But if we don't take this step, we're going to collapse. So, but we have, so we have to, with our eyes wide open. Why did he do that? Is it because he was just an honest guy? He does seem like quite an honest guy. But it's not, it's not simply about his personal characteristics. He was so honest, brutally honest actually, because he knew that only if the, if the, the leadership of the working class was an understood reality and was educated as Marxist revolutionaries, then only then can it actually lead the working class. And if the Communist Party has no idea what's happening or is walking backwards towards capitalism while saying like, charge, what impact is that going to have on the consciousness of the working class? which is the only force in society capable of building socialism. So the theoretical political degeneration creates an absolute barrier to, to further development, further progress. But I'll, I'll, I'll return to that point at the end. Uh, I found Keelan's intervention very interesting. And I think this un it offers more examples of what I described as this kind of bureaucratic Stalinist mentality. Always, even when St on, the very, on the few occasions where Stalin does actually overthrow capitalism, it's worth studying closely how he approaches that extremely gradually and cautiously, gropingly, <laughs> like, like a blind man groping in the dark. First, the, the Red Army is effectively the state after the Second World War. There isn't really much of a ruling class to overthrow. But even then, first we have to have basically power sharing with the bourgeoisie that barely exists. Then the, the, the actual overthrow of capitalism has to be carried out, first of all, through a series of parliamentary manoeuvres. And the reason for this is twofold. And there's a theme throughout the entire discussion, to be honest. And actually, I think it's, it's rooted in the archetypal mentality of a petty bureaucrat. Now, you know, bureaucrats get a hard time. Bureaucrats do carry out necessary functions in society. But, but try to picture in your mind's eye what you would imagine as kind of the archetypal characteristics of a petty bureaucrat. Conservatism, obsession over petty details, constant need for control and order, and above all, a nice quiet life. Isn't that the... Could you not think of a greater antithesis to the outlook of a revolutionary. The great contradiction in Eastern Europe is it, it, what the, they were revolutions, but carried out by a conservative bureaucracy. So there's this, this timidity and this gradualism on the one hand, and empiricism. But there's another side of this, which is the fear of the masses. The really gradual crawling pace of the revolutions in Eastern Europe. Yeah, it, it did reflect a fear of imperialism and trying to like catch them unawares almost. But also by confusing and, and misdirecting the masses, it meant that things didn't get out of control. If the moment they'd driven the Nazis out, they declared the socialist revolution in, any of the, in Poland, and the workers and peasants had read up, uh, uh, risen up, the Soviet Union would not be able to completely control the course of that movement. And it could well have resulted in a worker state, a healthier worker state, that posed a, a threat to the Soviet Union at home, not the Soviet Union, the Soviet bureaucracy at home. How many times have we seen a mass movement explode onto the scene and and workers and, and youth uh, setting up their own organs of struggle. You see that in the Russian Revolution. You see that in the First Intifada. You see that in the South African Revolution. You see it in the Sudanese Revolution recently. I think you could say it's an inherent characteristic of revolutions. But having embryonic organs of workers' power developing outside of the control of the bureaucracy is a very scary thing for the bureaucracy. And so those healthy elements have to be squeezed out and avoided from the very beginning, which is why, tragically, all of these regimes were um, deformed from the very beginning. And just one, one other thing on the mentality, you might remember that Marx quote I gave near the start. Marx says, while the petty bourgeois always seeks to bring the revolution to a conclusion as soon as possible, our task is to make the revolution permanent. In other words, the permanent revolution is the revolutionary proletarian outlook as opposed to the petty bourgeois outlook, ultimately. Um, I also, I found very interesting the reference to the German Democratic Republic, the DDR. Just a brief comment. Here we have not socialism in one country, but socialism in one part of a country. We laugh and it's absurd, but it happened. Not socialism, but the declaration that it was socialism. What an abomination. And again, this disgusting caricature of the world revolution is presented. Lenin said we would sacrifice the Russian revolution for the success of the German revolution. Here we have the defeat of Nazism and the sweeping of the Red Army all the way into Berlin. 
at last the possibility of achieving Lenin's goal, and the Soviet Union stitches up a partition deal with Western imperialism to carve up the living body of Germany, and even a single city, Berlin. You have a situation in which you have one city, and Berlin isn't a huge city. No offence to Berlin, it's a great city, but it's not a huge city. <laughs> well, one half you've got capitalism, and one half you've got socialism. What an absurdity. But we also see, it's a great example of, of Lenin and Trotsky's prediction, that if socialism or the worker state can't outproduce capitalism, it will be overwhelmed and defeated by the capitalist world market. Because it is more productive. Unless socialism can, uh, can reach the advanced capitalist countries. What happened in 1999? 1989, sorry. When the Berlin Wall fell, the main demand of the East German masses was not capitalism in the market, it was break down the wall, national unification, and democracy. But not necessarily bourgeois democracy, workers' democracy, real socialism, healthy socialism. But within weeks and months, once the wall came down, yeah, you had the circulation of people, but you also had the circulation of goods, simple, basic commodities that people could access for the first time. And once that flood of sheep commodities went, came in, there was no regime on earth that could push it out. And so the idea of maintaining so the idea of maintaining socialism in this half city or in this part of a country, it just disappeared. It disappeared. It, it dissolved in this flood of commodities. And actually, that is a risk for the Cuban revolution, just to hop back one second. The Cuban revolution has suffered the viciousness of American imperialism for a long time, harder than many, but it has also benefited in a weird way from the stupidity of American imperialism. Because actually, if the United States opened the blockade, and flooded Cuba with a mass of cheap commodities, they would probably succeed in overthrowing the planned economy quicker than they have done already, but that's a, another topic. A comrade asked a question about North Korea. Obviously, I, I don't have time to go into detail, but in some ways it's a mirror image of what happened um, in, in Europe. Korea was an extremely oppressed colony of Japanese imperialism, and comrades might be familiar with the, you know, the, the, the crimes and inhuman treatment of their colonies by, uh, well, by all imperialist powers, but in this case, Japanese imperialism. And Korea at this time is an overwhelmingly peasant, economically backward country. And with the defeat of Japanese imperialism in the war, a movement, a national movement of the peasants develops. And in the north, it falls under the, the guidance, should we say, the protection of the Soviet Union, whereas the United States establishes a foothold in the south. And what do the Stalinists do? They agree a partition of the country. Now, have you, have you, it's, it's, it was literally a straight line. At least the border between East and West Germany looked something like a border. And, you know, as, as artificial and absurd it was, it must have had some kind of his, history to it. They literally just picked, a, I think, latitude is when it goes up, isn't it? <laughs> On the map and went, right, well, that's, that's the border then, just a straight line. And that was agreed. Another time it was thought that they would, uh, they would f uh, establish an independent, unified Korea. US imperialism and the Soviet Union were going to work together to establish an independent, unified Korea. Uh, on, on what basis exactly? On the basis of a planned economy or on the basis of capitalism? So here we have an example of peaceful coexistence actually before the 60s. But it didn't last long and in, in 1948 a war begins between the North and the South. The North look like they're going to completely conquer the country. The United States comes in and pushes the, the, the North all the way back up. China then pours millions of troops in and, and basically balances the, the balance of forces. And in the course of that 2.4 million people are killed in order to maintain this straight line on a map which is now the euphemistically titled demilitarized zone. Um, and in the course of this war, I mean, the, Americans, the American generals came home traumatized and disturbed by the atrocities they committed. So I'll come to the point. What kind of regime do you think will emerge out of a situation like that? A, a miniature bureaucratically planned economy established under the um, protection of the Soviet Union, which has been completely devastated in a war, but where power wasn't seized by a, a revolutionary workers' party like the Bolsheviks. And so the ideology of the ruling North Korean party always had a kind of a religious, mystical quality to it. Kim Il-sung was said to have received enlightenment at the top of this mountain, then come down to lead the peasants, a bit like Moses. No, you know, no regime can just ra raise itself artificially above its conditions. We're materialists. And then under, uh, under conditions of extreme isolation, we see this, I um, don't know the right word for it, let's say bizarre regime develop. One interesting fact, though, in the 1960s, the North actually had a higher standard of living than the South. Um, but with a lot of American support, the, South, the southern economy started to develop faster. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, North Korea went through its own kind of special period. 
And so conservatives often, or reactionaries often like to talk about, oh, North Korea shows this like satanic, atheistic Marxism and we're all going to live like that. North Korea is an extreme example of what happens when a revolution in a backward country is isolated for decades. And now somebody mentioned China, I don't have time to go into that question. But what is socialism with Chinese characteristics doing in North Korea? Setting up special economic zones where Chinese businesses exploit, exploit Korean labor, North Korean labor, to make super profits. And this, which is, that is imperialism, that is the export of capitalism, and reducing North Korea to essentially a colony of Japan, uh, Japan uh, China, sorry, slip of the tongue. That is publicly announced as a partnership between two socialist countries. So this is the logical endpoint of socialism in one country. As I said, socialism nowhere. And on the an, an abandonment of um, internationalism resulting in reformism, um, Nicholas has already given at least part of an answer to this question. And the reality is there are many answers to, or several answers to this question. Because socialism in one country is not just, well, socialism in one country is not just an idea, which then logically leads one to a reformist position, although it does contain the lot potential for that. Socialism in one country was the ideological reflection of the degeneration of the Soviet bureaucracy. And so it follows all of the bureaucracy's twists and turns, absorbs a bit more disease before it becomes what I described in terms of China and North Korea. It's like the picture of Dorian Gray, it gets uglier and uglier. You know, ideas don't have their own independent existence, independent evolution. But we see how socialism in one country does evolve. It evolves from, we're not yet a socialism, but we can build it here, to, we have built it here, but it would be good if other people build it too, to support us, to, it would be actually better if nobody else built it and just let us get on with it, to eventually, actually, you don't need to build socialism at all anywhere. Just develop the productive forces any way you can. That's what that's the Dengism, basically, and that traces the kind of short history of the Soviet Union and the World Revolution that we've talked about today. Just one last quick point uh, on that. Part of how socialism in one country did lead concretely to this abandonment of reformism is each national party was supposed to find its own way to socialism based on the existing conditions. What that meant? What what are the conditions? What are the conditions in Britain in the the 1960s or today? Are we, are we in the middle of a revolution in Britain? No, we're not. The mood is becoming... There's, there's a lot of rage in Britain right now. But the absolute majority of the British pop population has not stood up and announced we are going to overthrow capitalism in Britain right now. So the conditions in Britain are the masses aren't ready for socialism yet. So therefore, the tactics and the strategy of the party need to ad adapt to that. It's very clever. Therefore, we need to meet them part of the way and just... They, they are reformist, so we just need a reformist government. Now, it's almost like a perverted version of the United Front, where if workers have reformist illusions, we support putting in power critically to expose them. And we also base... Uh, and another point is, you adapt yourself to the bounds of the bourgeois nation-state. You are limiting your programme to the bounds of the bourgeois regime. The nation-state is part of the bourgeois regime. It is an inherent part of the class rule of the bourgeoisie. It hasn't existed before then. And once you've adapted yourself to that, it's quite a slippery slope to start as, uh, accepting and adapting to other aspects of the bourgeois state and the, nationalist, and the nationalist prejudices that do exist in the masses. So now in Britain, you have Communist Party members not just with uh, the British flag, but with the English flag of St. George. So it becomes socialism in one country. Which country? <laughs> and that, you know, that's, that's the funny side, but of course we see the disgusting side in Yugoslavia. The key to all of this is method. We've actually been having a philosophical discussion the whole time. The truth is that these communist parties, we base ourselves on the conditions as well, don't we? We don't just stand, we don't just stand on the sidelines and lecture the workers about you should be dis establishing the dictatorship of the proletariat right now in a sectarian manner. The difference is we see within these conditions, not just the possibility, the inevitability of future transformations. And we know the transformations are going to move in the direction of our ideas because we understand the underlying processes, like the capitalist crisis. Whereas what we see throughout this discussion is what unites all Stalinism is this slavish worship of the accomplished fact. Engels said that opportunism is the sacrifice of the interests, the long-term interests of the movement for the interests of the moment, of now. We base, us, we base ourselves on the future, a, ba a future we grasp with the method of dialectics, the logic of revolution, the algebra of revolution. <laughs> so when I say we must build the RCI, we must build the Revolutionary Communist International, we must, we must build on this foundation, 
the foundation of Marxism. That's what Marxism is. Just to get, I, I do need to stop, but I'd want to give you one more example, okay? Sorry. It's a good one, though. It's a, it is a good one. In 2017, an international meeting of communist and worker parties met and issued a statement about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, and in, it, in it contains a quote from Lenin, which you have to hear. Without the revolutionary party, there can be no revolutionary movement. There is no Lenin quote. There is no quote of that by Lenin. The quote is without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. What makes your party revolutionary? Slogans, clothing, or the traditions of a revolution that took place in the past that you have usurped? The only thing that makes our international either revolutionary or communist are the ideas of Marxism, which we have the honor of defending today. Forward to the world revolution, comrades. Long live the revolutionary communist international.